Hello and welcome to Jester of Godot. I am determined to learn how to do game development, even if I have to make a fool of myself. Uh, hopefully I can learn from the experiences of others along the way who have uh, uh, had their bumps and bruises. And if you're interested in doing game development, uh, I hope you will learn from them alongside me. So one of the folks that caught my attention is Kenneth Dunlop of Plasma Beam Games. And uh, he wrote an article uh, uh, that I thought was, was pretty helpful, pretty insightful. It was uh, basically that you can't beat Batman, right? You're going to have to do your own thing. So Kenneth, uh, uh, thanks for writing that article and for agreeing to, to talk with me today. Welcome. Hey, oh, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm. I'm. <laughs> I'm always glad when people find value in the articles because that was that was the idea. I am trying to. Uh, I mean, in a way, my uh, my money making scheme. Here, here is my evil money making scheme. I want to give value to people <laughs> so that they like my stuff, and actually, it makes things better, and then that will eventually make me money. There's. There's the uh, the evils of capitalism at work there for you. So yeah, I'm just always glad when when somebody does find that stuff useful. My God, that is nefarious. But yes, let's see let's see if we can make that work somehow. Um, yeah, I, I I think when it comes to uh, trying to compete with AAA studios, we've all played these games that are just fantastic, right? And it, it makes us want to be game developers. And and uh, so you know we all kind of have this wild ambition of being the next Skyrim or, or uh, Starcraft or, or something like that and making those kind of things. Uh, is, that, is that what uh, drove you when you started um, uh, Super Sp Space Slayer? That, that's the, uh, the, your first game, I believe, right? Um, well, not so much that. I, I think the history would be kind of in my early 20s. I'm 38 now. I've been through this for a while. But I'd say in my early 20s, yeah, I definitely thought in kind of AAA terms. I was playing stuff like Devil May Cry 3 and um, I don't know, what, whatever else was around back then. It mostly feels like Devil May Cry 3, Resident Evil 4, like kind of big AAA games. I, I feel like kind of God of War, Devil May Cry 3 was a bit of a golden age for AAA games. I mean, it helps that I was at university and able to play Devil May Cry 1 and things up in my bedroom and all of that. But yeah, I was definitely thinking in AAA terms back then, and I was trying to think of this big overarching adventure, and I ended up making a couple of game concept documents even, and I think game concept documents might be kind of fake as well, actually, well, that's a bit of a side issue. But yeah, I was definitely thinking in terms of like, if only somebody would just give me millions of dollars, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure I have a clear enough vision and I could communicate it to everyone and make this thing. And I, I guess real life kind of whittles away at that dream piece by piece until you kind of start with something you can actually make. And there's kind of two sides to that, because on the one hand, yeah, you're not going to get the millions of dollars, but I think you also kind of have to set your goal somewhere kind of difficult. Like it's got, it can't just be, oh, I should just set my goals nice and small and modest and just make Pong over a weekend or something, because nobody's going to care. You know, and maybe that's kind of interesting for your like long term growth, but no one cares if you make Pong. And I think that's one of the, the huge problems nowadays with game design and, and teaching kids programming and stuff is that nobody cares about Pong anymore. And if you're new to programming, it's difficult to even make Pong. So kids particularly just don't don't see the bridge between yeah. sitting at the computer and then one day you have Final Fantasy 16 or something. Like, what's the bridge there? It is, it is tough to see. And, and you kind of have to go for it anyway. Yeah, that's actually, that's exactly where I'm at. Uh, I'm, I'm a few years ahead of you. I'm at 41 years old now and just starting my game development journey. Um, and so it's a little bit crazy on the one hand, but on the other hand, I, you know, I see kids that are, you know, teenagers or even in their early twenties pumping out games that are really impressive. And so I, I think to myself, well, you know, if they can do that at that age and with that level of experience, then, uh, you know, give me five years, let's see what we can do. So you got to get started at some point, right? Yeah. I hear in later life, you're actually you've kind of got more stat points or something. You can do yeah. things quicker. So yeah, I, I, I mean, another, there's a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but I think people have got the wrong idea about like at which age you're, you're coolest and most powerful. <laughs> right. 
like so I, I think this one might even be a bit of a caveman thing actually like i wouldn't be surprised if the average 30 year old caveman was dead right right like if you're talking true. pure caveman stuff saber-toothed tigers roaming the wilderness maybe a 30 year old caveman is dead so people's instincts when they reach 30 think oh dear well i'm probably over the hill now you know <laughs> right any minute now is saber the tooth tiger and that is a huge problem now we live in this world where our, our genes and bones and instincts are telling us one thing and then I mean, I'll keep even math that you have is that math or maths I no, guess that, that, well in america math. it's it's usually just math you but, only have the one math. Yeah, we we've only yeah. got the one. <laughs> but it's yeah, true. we yeah. I think we and then I kind of believed it for a while as well. Like I expected to be having this awesome time when I was twenty, but I'm I'm, I'm powering up more and more. So if any youngins are listening to this, like so long as you stay the course, you're going to get gradually more awesome as it goes on. It's fine. It's fine. Like don't because there's there's not that many people who are going to tell you that. I think. Yeah, no, I, I also do feel that way. I mean, my hairline has definitely receded, but my awesomeness has come forward. And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, I, I've, yeah, I've been through the same thing. I lost my hair in my 20s or something. It was just like, I was getting this kind of bull patch up there, solidly my grandpa's jeans. It's just, it was weird. I was looking at myself in the, the mirror on my dresser back then and kind of, I always wondered who I looked like. And then somehow with my, the light would just go through all the hair that was doomed. The light just went straight through it. <clears throat> and, and somehow with, with this like ghost hair now, <laughs> this do <laughs> these doomed hairs, I could just sort of see my grandpa's face just emerging, like <laughs> emerging out of my own skull. So yeah, I don't, but at the same time, it's, you know, he was a pretty cool grandpa. So it feels like an honor to, to carry his genes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let's dip into some of that grandfatherly, uh, uh, wisdom and yes. <laughs> uh, uh, just kind of talk a little bit about the article and about some of the experiences that you had. So just to sort of prime people for it, I'm going to put it in the description and I, and I think you should read it, but um, I, you know, I wanted to, to kind of whet people's appetite for it. And uh, so you actually dressed up like a cultist from your yeah. game. And that, that was a cool, like really striking picture because you looked pretty awesome in that, in that uniform. Yeah, it, yeah. Didn't really, it didn't really have the effect that you had hoped. Is, it, is that basically what happened? No, yeah, because um, I, I worked pretty hard on the costumes as well. I mean, they're based pretty heavily on the cultists in Resident Evil 4, by the way. I, I, I mean, it kind of started with demons, I think. I like games about killing demons. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a good kind of punching bag. And I figured if you have demons, it's nice to have demonic cultists and things. So we designed these demonic cultists. Uh, originally, we were going to have kind of KKK hoods for them. <clears throat> kind of based on Earthbound and I guess the KKK and things and, and the cultists in Diablo 3. I try to kind of take in a good number of influences for these things. Like, it's not a rip-off if you've got, like, two or three influences. <laughs> right. But, um, but they're kind of Resident Evil 4 cultists. So, yeah, I put loads of work into the costumes and the plan was they're in a live-action trailer as well. Maybe we could link that. And uh, I, I guess I thought having a costume, this thing... Maybe there's cosplay stuff going on that would somehow help. In, in a way, it was just, yeah, it was a bit of sort of a, a blind copy, I think, about what I was doing. I think the article kind of mentions this that I, I was looking at the success I could see around me, like Batman booths and things. If Rocksteady Games have a new Batman game, there's all this stuff going on. They've got cards they give out. They've got this big booth with a load of scenery in it. They got the game. They might have like girls dressed as Harley Quinn walking around. Well, I think they probably do that last these days. And uh and, you know, people dress people just independent of Rocksteady were up there dressed as Batman or the Penguin. I think we took a, a picture of them, a little short video of them. There might still be evidence of that in Facebook. So the, this this huge kind of circus going on, all in the name of Batman, and you think, okay, if I want to be successful like Batman, I have to do something like that. And so I, it's uh, yeah, Vistaprint are great for these things. Like all I did was use Vistaprint. You have to design the stuff yourself. It takes some work. We got cards. We got a poster that I think is based on the Phantom Menace's poster. That <laughs> I think it's laid out like Phantom Menace. Might be able to release the the pictures exist somewhere. But I could probably release them again. They're in the article. Most of these, and and for later events as well. It, it didn't work the first time. I, I, we brought plastic guns as well. Uh, the, the, I think the best way to explain the plastic guns is actually they're used in the Mariah Carey music video for "Touch My Body." 
just mind blowing because I, I I saw that and I realized, oh, look, crap, those are the guns we have, <laughs> like same guns Mariah Carey uses. So, we call, so I call them Mariah Carey's now, and nobody else does. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah, more to the point of what you're asking me, yeah, we, we had this tons of stuff and we got more stuff as it went along as well. I think at one point when Reading Comic Con was going to happen, it, it got cancelled eventually. I was planning on uh, having this, there was this new demonic cube weapon I had in the game, Super Space Slayer 2. I think, yeah, that, that exists. I was, I was going to get green candies and kind of give those out as demonic cubes. And, and there'll be a, there was one time a high score thing going on with the game. We had a projector. Just, just doing any old thing, and I've seen other people using disco balls and stuff. I mean, there's kind of name dropping this guy, uh, Mamo Castle, made by Quang. He he's everywhere at these gaming events. He was dressed up as a cat a lot of the time. He doesn't seem to do that now. But anyway, so so I was part of this kind of indie collection of people, all sort of desperately trying stuff just trying to make this sort of razzle-dazzle to get people to play the game. And I actually, I guess actually, now you mention it, I was kind of focusing on the wrong stuff because uh, one thing I definitely found was people like to look at controllers, like they recognize controllers. You've got to jack into what people already recognize. <laughs> and uh, having, I deliberately got these tablets to be bigger and not just be little phones, but the tablets weren't enough even. People wanted to see a big visible screen and a recognizable controller. And I know because like there was this game Warp Ball opposite me one time. I think I, I left a camera up trying to get, tr I was hoping to capture the delighted faces of people playing Super Space Slayer 2. <laughs> but who oh boy, all, all it captured instead, the footage just showed people not noticing the game, going over to play Warp Ball, or it might have been Block Ships or something as well. But, and, and, you know, seeing that screen, seeing that controller, and just having some sense that there was a game to be played. And I, I saw people take the chairs at my booth and take them away and put them on that booth. So I just kind of witnessed my humiliating defeat for like two hours of footage. <laughs> but uh, fr from my humiliating defeat, others may learn, and, and so may I, I think. So, yeah, so I'm glad the article was helpful there, because normally I think if you that's the good thing. Like if you, you do stuff like this and it doesn't work, you at least you normally get something out of it. If you choose to, you know, I think there's uh, I, I read quite a lot of self helpy books and things these days as well. I've done for a couple of years. I've got quite a library of that in my head, but uh, was it? I'm trying to remember who it was, but anyway, it's one of the books, one of them all kind of lumped together in my head says, um, like it, Bad times can be very useful for you because it's it's in situations like that that you're forced to think. Mm. And I, I hate to say it because I've, I've there's been several bad times I've definitely not enjoyed. But you do if you choose to, you do often come out of them with like some pretty big insights that will help guide you in the future. So yeah, just if times are shitty, you do try and get the lesson out of them. Otherwise, you really have gained nothing from them. Yeah, and, and it sounds like that might be what helps you keep going forward after, you know, what feels like a humiliating defeat is information that you can use to refine your approach and, uh, and, and hone your skills. And, and it's, it sounded like watching people play your game was maybe the most valuable thing that you got out of it, rather than convincing them to, play, to buy it. Yeah, I don't think I convinced. Essentially, I made no money from the game, so that wasn't really uh, what I got out of it. But I think uh, in some ways, Super Space Galaxy is a sort of reaction against the previous one because it's not a mobile game anymore. I was talking to publishers about this stuff as well, and all of them would say, we don't do mobile games because it's this very extreme system where either you're basically nobody like I was just releasing a game onto the store or your Clash of Clans or something, and there's not very much in between, I think. Mm. So the, all the publishers were just saying we're not, you know, we're not top dogs. So we don't do mobile games. Okay, so I, and, and it's it's kind of tough to look at that and think, well, here's this mobile game I've made that's taken years. Let's just forget about that now and make a whole other game that could easily take years as well. And it has now. It's been sort of two and a half years or something. So yeah, and, and I think so much of this actually is kind of about being rational. Like I mean, it'd be easy to do kind of sunk cost fallacy or something, saying, "Well, I've invested so much in this game, I'm just going to 
ride or die with this game that I know doesn't work. But you, you've got to be able to abandon that game, go to the next game, and kind of keep on going and, and see the bigger picture, I think. Yeah, so I've got a thesis that I can um, use my knowledge of math and incorporate that into the games in a way that will make, you know, finally make educational games fun because mostly they suck, right? So that's yeah. my that's my starting thesis. What do you what are your what's your take on that? Um, educate because I think that the best way to be educated is kind of inadvertently, you know, secretly. Like nobody, I think part of the problem is honestly school. I'm kind of suspicious of school now. Mm -hmm. I wonder, like, it pisses me off so much to hear, like, well, now that you're done going to school, young man, now your real education begins. <laughs> that that pisses me off so much, and you hear that sometimes. Yeah, like, well, like, what the hell were you even doing with me? You sent me to this this government run camp for kids just to what to just keep me out of the way of my parents all day i suppose and i was taught a bunch of stuff most of which is not actually useful to what i really want to be doing the maths i will vouch for i had a good maths teacher and i will vouch for maths and equations but no matter what you were taught it probably wasn't very useful most of the time and yeah, I, I think school teaches you a bunch of bad lessons. One of which is being wrong about stuff is very bad. Like if you get yeah. zero, if you get zero out of twenty in the test, that's bad. And nobody quite says that, but that's certainly how they let you feel. And nobody tells you you're feeling the wrong way, so they they teach you that one. And I think if you want to do something weird like make games, <laughs> yeah, you've got to you've got to unlearn that definitely. Like getting zero out of twenty in the test could just mean you learn twenty new things. <laughs> Yeah, you're sort of discouraged from taking risks by the way that the grading system it, uh, operates. It's 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 really kind of a poorly designed game in a lot of ways, right? Because if you're trying to if you're trying to get a high score, what do you do? You take the easiest classes possible. You don't take any difficult classes because that might mess up your GPA. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. And so it's like that that's and that's one perspective that you can have about education but that's a very common one i would say and there's and because it's so competitive that's that's probably the dominant way of looking at it yeah and i, I guess man i was trying to think of the other so we, we've got yeah kind of fear of getting it wrong oh, and i guess the other lesson is that the answers are already known like the yeah, answers yeah. The, the answers are all there in the textbook all you've got to do is remember them and in fact, remembering stuff's a bit of a false friend as well. Like memory is a kind of intelligence, but I would say in the world of like Googling things, mm -hmm. what good is it to remember a bunch of stuff? Like you've got kind of bad friends if they're terribly impressed by your ability to just remember stuff. You know, that's kind right. of quiz, that's quiz show thinking. Yeah. It was all, oh, if I was in that quiz show, I would remember all the stuff and it would make me loads of money in this weird quiz show that hardly anybody actually gets to go on it, it's yeah there's an awful lot of bad lessons it, it's the big overarching lessons it's teaching you too not just like stuff in geography or something but the whole kind of structure of the thing teaches you wrong and uh i'm, I'm sure i'll get to some other i've forgotten what the other problem with school was what was the question in the first place well i, I was wondering what your thoughts are on ed educational games because i don't know the indie game uh, realm quite as well as you do and i'm sure anything i'm trying someone else at some point has already tried like that's almost a guarantee in oh, yeah. that you do. oh so, well i guess that, that's right so i think a uh, bad lesson number three from school would be that learning stuff is this terribly boring process mm -hmm. where it's mostly about sitting still and learning from a tech when i'm i like reading myself now reading since your skill people are losing because of the, like the way the media is now all fast but yeah, the learning is boring and you have to kind of sit there and listen and maybe that's cheaper to do or something than letting kids run around. I don't know. And, and maybe it would be more disorganized if they got to run around. But actually, learning is kind of wild. And actually, when you're learning properly, it's kind of fun. Like, it's exciting. Right. And you're doing new stuff. You know, you're discovering things that are at least new to you. And it's it's fun and exciting. And, and you don't even really think of yourself kind of having to learn or learning or so it really teaches you that it kind of teaches you the wrong stuff about how learning feels to do. Even you get completely the wrong idea about when you're learning and when you're actually doing stuff. It's it is kind of more like adventure in a movie or something. It's like you've got to do the the adventurous path, and and you learn more. And for example, I've got this other article about how I handle. I mean, looking at your math there, 
I have an article about how I handled the uh, planet generating. There was a lot of work went into that. Like I was wondering about that. Yeah. 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 It, it, it was, it was, it's horrible. Like, yeah. Another case of like, where you set yourself this goal and you've got to kind of put yourself through a, a real kind of valley of despair to get there. And if you stick to it, you, you come out a stronger man at the other end. But yeah. So the, the biggest discovery was I eventually arranged my planets quickly in terms of these chunky blocks of 20 by 20, 400 blocks in all. And uh, the real coup for me was I needed to find a way of like blending between bl one block and another. So it's just a bunch of numbers going from 100 to zero, where 100 to 80 or something would be trees, and then you have grass, and then you have dirt, and then you have water. And kind of those textures turn into all that stuff. But what I needed was like, if I'm in a given square, what number should I have given the kind of four relevant squares around me? And that, that was actually not a trivial problem at all. Like, it's kind of obvious what result you want, but how you tell the computer to get that result was, was a tough process. And maybe you'd find it easier, but I, I did all sorts of things. I tried like eight different equations, I think. Like, for two weeks, I was obsessing about that problem going home after work, because I, I do have a day job still for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Just going home after work and trying some weird equation. And this is where a lot of people, I mean, we probably haven't got time to get into Arnold Schwarzenegger in this. This is probably a bit off topic. But one of Arnold's big principles is don't listen to the naysayers. Because it is natural when you have big goals that the naysayers are going to come along and they're going to try and tell you this cannot be done. And and so for a while, I, I doubted whether what I was trying to do was mathematically possible. Not just possible for me, but like possible mathematically or... Or whatever. I mean, in the end, I think the, what you do is you have the four the four points you're essentially doing on the block. You judge the distance in the x and y dimensions separately, and then you multiply them together. So it's almost like an inverse square law or something. And so what? And that way, it blends just fine, and you, it, it works. But I had to do eight equations. I had to come up with eight wacky theories before I finally come into the theory that actually worked. And, and for the article, I think I've got a, a thing from Arnold where he talks about going to this weightlifting event and, and trying to lift 500 pounds. And, and 10 times he failed to lift 500 pounds, but the, the 11th time or something, he succeeded. <laughs> so, you know, guess what matters more? So I, I didn't do quite 10 times, but it, th that was kind of it. And you know, like I, I see this thing happen again and again. It does seem to be the pattern. Like I see the the squeals of indie developers quite a bit on Reddit. Uh, and something I saw recently was somebody saying it it shouldn't be this hard. Right. <laughs> it shouldn't be this hard. I'm I'm trying to make a game, and all the games I see look slickly produced, and it's all good stuff. But it shouldn't be this hard. And actually, the, I think the, the dirty secret is that it is this hard. And the successes you see poking out the top there of like Batman or whatever, or Assassin's Creed or something, are just that it's this pile of bones in a trench. You know, people yeah. are climbing up on the bones. Like it is, it is founded on these bones. It is just bones in a trench is somehow what I see. So, yeah. And then, yeah, it, it's sort of, it is that hard. I almost think of like, I think in Lord of the Rings terms a lot of the time. And uh, I'm kind of imagining Frodo sitting there trying to make a game or something. It, it shouldn't be this hard. Like, there's too many orcs. Like, what the hell is going on? Alas, these unhappy days should be mine kind of thing. And you do feel like that sometimes. And yeah, I guess what I want to, if I want to say anything, it's just that that's, that is normal. If you're trying to do something weird and new or reproduce something good you've seen, yeah, you, you've got to you've got to do terrible things and then push yourself to the limit sometimes. And so long as you don't stop, it will eventually get there. Well, I think part of it too, is that it, it can be such a lonely enterprise. Uh, you know, that's one of the, the uh, commentaries that I hear, uh, you know, people saying is that I, it, it was miserable going through all this by myself and, and, you know, struggling for like five years to make my game. And, you know, that, that, that's one, uh, uh, that's one kind of experience. And then, but I think, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do here. That's where I'm using my experience. Cause I would have just tried to do this all by myself and just, you know, plug through for a very long time. Uh, except that at this stage of my life, I know I don't necessarily have to do it that way. I can have conversations with other people, uh, that are going through the same things. And that, uh, I, I think can be invigorating a, a bit more in a way that, 
you know, talking to my wife uh, and having her ask, why is this taking you so long? And why are you wasting your time? You know, why are you doing this? That that's a, that's a completely different kind of a conversation. And she's right too. Right. I mean, it, this is just a hobby. I have, I have to kind of look at it that way uh, because, and, and initially I wasn't. Um, so that that's, you know, just an adjustment I've had to make already on my journey. Cause I thought I was going to make money at, at uh, uh, my my first game, like that was the challenge Ooh, that I had. Set yeah, up and well, I think I I thought yeah. so as well. Yeah, and I think there, m- there must be a barrier. A lot of people here, I definitely did. Where you release your first game, and think, oh boy, now I mean, my mom as well. Like it's not just an age thing. Like my mom was thinking, oh, well, now we're going to get a trickle of income. A tr- right, not a big thing, but a trickle of income. Those were her words, and of course, <laughs> they, you get you get jack shit. And I think of it like. <laughs> I think like if you go to Argos or something, they've got that big book there of what's in the back there. But if there was a game that you would like just in the back there somewhere, are you actually going to find it? Like, even if it genuinely is good, even if you will like it, even if you'll fall in love with it the moment you see it, are you even going to find it? Mm-hmm. Or, or like if you if you pinned up, I mean, even less ambiguous, like if you were to take a hundred bucks and just pin it up on a tree somewhere that hundred bucks is valuable but nobody knows it's there so nobody's going to take it right and and that is there's just kind of welcome to marketing at which point there's a whole other thing I and mean, we could possibly get into that as well but yeah, yeah i so would I, I would actually like to we'll, we'll circle sure. back to that I'm, I'm, I'm i should probably say something more about the educational games as well so I, yeah i Apart from just complaining about school, I am very suspicious of school, though. It was designed by, like, Victorians and things and hasn't changed much since. Yep. But, um, yeah, um, so, yeah, I think educating people accidentally is probably the way to go. And and the stuff kids will learn for games is nuts as well. Like, I remember reeling off facts about Willie Beamish and things in the early 90s. It's a bit of an old one, but just, you know, kids will learn all sorts of crazy stuff about Pokemon. You just mm-hmm. got to kind of gamify what they're learning and make it useful for what they're doing. And, and I guess maybe that's another way school kind of falls down for us. Like, it's it's an awful lot more fun and easy to learn this stuff if it's actually for a purpose you're invested in. Whereas if you're just kind of memorizing facts for the exam to get your, your exam points. Right. For some distant... I don't think your exam results even matter very much, actually. It didn't seem to do me any good. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so setting yourself a purpose and then learning. Because I, I even saw someone on Reddit saying that he was he was learning maths and learning physics or something so that he could do better at game design. And I got to tell him that, yeah, it's, it's all very well, but you want to set yourself a game design purpose first and then learn the maths for that. Mm. Because I, I did, I mean, th- things like the projectiles that come out of the enemies in this game, I did have to l- relearn things about ballistics and stuff that maybe ancient Greek philosophers have studied or something. I had to kind of rediscover ballistics and, and watch videos about triangles, not quite sure what they were going to show. But eventually it, it happened and ballistics exist again now. But if you just sort of sat me down and said, oh, no, Kenneth, you need to learn all the maths so that you can make this game, that would just be the the dumbest thing. So, yeah, don't just sit there and learn all the maths. Try and (laughs) I think it's possible maths goes on forever anyway. There might always be more. But, um, yeah, don't learn all the maths or all the anything. Just set yourself the purpose and then learn what you need to learn to get there, basically. Yeah. Well, and that's that's kind of what I want to do with what, what what my vision is for like my ultimate game the the dream game uh that i that i'm capable of envisioning right now would be something where um it's it's almost like a role playing game but uh instead of having you know thieves and wizards and and paladins and things like that you have various different types of mathematicians so some will specialize in logic and some would specialize in geometry and some would specialize in uh, calculus or whatever it is, and they each unlock different abilities based on what they're what they're doing. And um, you're not learning the next formula because you're going to be tested on it, and so you're afraid of what's going to happen if you don't. It's more like as you unlock additional possibilities, then you get access to more more things. So, like once you learn calculus, projectile motion, something like that. Then you can do artillery barrages, but you have you have to do the calculus to, to do. Ah, it. 
Yeah, you know, I always think of uh, catapults because uh, when I was a yeah. kid, I played Civilization One, which I think I must have. There was a Civipedia that must have taught me all sorts of stuff. That's how I know about phalanxes. Like it was mm -hmm. like Civilization One and Three Hundred is everything I know about phalanxes. But um, what happens is if your civilization discovers mathematics, so when you, you'd think. What struck me was you'd think math is this very sort of a feat thing done by math teachers in universities and stuff. But one of the, the first thing maths gives you is catapults. Yeah. You, you can get these big wooden war engines that all of a sudden can throw rocks. And like, if, if you think maths is for pansies, just you can't argue with rocks, right? <laughs> <laughs> and even, right. A cave, even a caveman can understand that whatever power brought those rocks accurately onto our castle is, is a mighty power. Like, whatever that is, whatever you think maths is, like, you can't argue with rocks. Yeah, Napoleon uh, was actually an artillery officer who used calculus extensively. That's that's how he rose through the ranks is because of, one of the reasons is because of his uh, proficiency at maths. So, uh, yeah. you, you, like you said, you can't argue with the rocks. You can't argue with cannonballs. Yeah, like, that, that works. I mean, obviously, there, there's other more kind of... We I understand there's branches of maths that can't even in in principle be given practical application, and they're <laughs> right. fi they're fine right. too. I mean, right. we've got my brother knows some guy we call a mathematician because he just sort of does that, and it's God knows what he's doing. Just push it. I guess he's not just pushing symbols around. The symbols mean something, and they express beautiful truths. But I, I'm not sure there's any rocks that that can be guided by these truths. But so so I but I agree with you that learning really can be something that's fun if it's presented properly. And I can remember back to my childhood playing some math games, like there was a dungeon and there was like spiders that would come down. And if you do, if you do some math problems, you defeat the spider. And that was more fun than the lectures. That's all I can say. I'm not saying it was like <laughs> the perfect game that's going to go blockbuster, yeah. but for, for what it was and, and where I was at that, that stage of development, it was, um, it was more fun than the math lectures. So it sounds like kind of the the maths equivalent of typing of the dead or something. Like you're yeah, still yeah. you're still typing, but at least it kills zombies as well, and that's kind exactly. of exactly nice. <laughs> kills zombies as well. That's that's the goal. So <coughs> sorry, I'm getting over cold here, um, but I I hope it'll work. I I don't know. I I think you have to just test out the thesis and see how it works because the vision that I have is not something that anybody else would be able to produce you know they everybody's going to do their own interpretation of what could be fun and what you know what's going to make for a good game and so uh it, it, you know i guess ultimately i've got to try it and and nobody can tell me one way or the other whether, whether it'll work <clears throat> but i was just kind of curious of what kind of things you had might might have seen in the in the indie space because i haven't really run across a lot of people that are trying to do educational games it's really just pure fun but I, i'm thinking a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down kind of a kind of a thinking on it yeah well I, I guess what i would i guess what i would really want to do normally there's a smart solution for this as well like salute the dumb solution would be just let's not make it educational slightly smarter would be let's make it artificially educational and just kind of you have a game and then you get given a maths puzzle or something <clears throat> but i think the really smart solution kind of the third option would be let's make it so the maths puzzle organically sorts things out like and I mean, catapults would be something I would be familiar with. Like, if you figure out how catapults work, you can destroy the enemy castle, and right. then you get to walk around their castle now, and everyone congratulates you on doing a good job destroying this castle or whatever. But then you kind of know, oh, right, that's because I looked at the distance between the catapult and the castle in horizontal space or whatever, and now I know what an arc is and things, and I... And maybe there's other applications you could have. And I, I think one of the, the troubles you'll have is the just a sort of persistence gap. Like for kids particularly, it's then they're not so good at persisting in things. They're not don't really think long term. They, they like learning kind of quick demonstrable stuff. Yeah. If it's kind of but the, this more programmery thing of kind of plugging away, sitting in the madness. Uh, I think that's that's a bit of a more adult skill you've got to have. I think we're. When that, that's, that's something I could almost do an article about as well. Just to, I think to really uh, succeed at these things, yeah, you, you do have to get comfortable with this sort of, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just watching videos about triangles that are telling me stuff and I don't understand half of it. And I'm just hoping that they will tell them what I, and they did in the end, of course. But it just takes a bit of faith as well. Yeah. Well, and you do, I, I really do believe you have to be willing to feel kind of foolish for a time 
uh, in order to I- improve your proficiency in anything that you want to get good at. And, you know, that's, that's the whole theme behind my gesture of Godot persona is, uh. is, is that, uh, you know, you've got to, uh, let yourself be, be a bit of a fool because there are areas of my, of my life where I'm very competent. I know it very well. I have a lot of experience. Game development happens not to be one of them. Right. And so pushing yeah. myself into that discomfort and, and, uh, you know, into this realm where I'm struggling to make Pong, right? Like that, that's still <laughs> yeah. where I'm at at this point. So, um, you know, I, I, I agree with you. That's a, that's an adult skill and that's a, um, uh, you know, that, that's something that I hope I can nudge students towards, but, uh, it, that will be the challenge. I agree. That's, that's, yeah, I, I certainly, I remember like my early twenties. I, I mean, it's a bit of a waste now. I look back and think if only I had gone to the gym more or something, cause, or if I had persisted with the games I was making then more like you, you don't, yeah, I think you, you're not used to going through that kind of <laughs> valley of uncertainty. <clears throat> I mean, and since you've mentioned gestures and things, I kind of do have to mention Lion King. Cause I mean, Jordan Peterson has this big breakdown of Lion King that is full of, it's very sort of consciously symbolic. And and one of the things Simba encounters is the, what's he, Rafiki, I think, the this the he's monkey, somebody's yeah. really specific kind of monkey or something. And he's like symbolic of the wisdom of his ancestors. But Rafiki is kind of a, a weird sort of jestery kind of foolish character. Like he's, he's not afraid to look foolish. And, and that's what, and I guess monkeys are the smartest animals, you know, they're most like humans. So he's, He's not afraid to look foolish, and that's why he's the wisest. Yeah, yeah, that that's an interesting observation. That's uh, well, that's, that's completely not my obs. That's just one hundred percent Jordan yeah. Peterson material. But I think that's yeah, that's the kind of thing. No, I've if seen I'm, that video. That 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 is a good video, though. Um, <laughs> and I and I I hope that that uh, that kind of a message does does get across because there you know there's so much um, there's there's so much clutter, especially with. Uh, this is another thing that, that sort of has been uh, paralyzing for me is that you can get endlessly, you know, uh, sucked into the rabbit hole um, of, of things like politics and, and uh, ideologies and just, you know, reading. I, I would just read and read and read, but it doesn't move you forward. What really matters, I think, is getting skills, building skills. And so uh, you mentioned maths as being one of the skills that uh, has helped you on your your programmer journey. Uh, yeah. Persistence is another skill. What what are some of the other skills that you would really emphasize on um, uh, building? I, the artwork is beautiful for your for your. Uh, oh, thanks. Well, yeah, it's, well, it's not. Unfortunately, I can't take credit for that. That is all. Um, what was it called? Um, Daniel God. Daniel Cook. This this was all done in 1995. It's the art from Tyrion. Oh, okay. So, but I, I was thrilled when I found out that was just free, and you could okay. just. Uh, so yeah, he, it's completely released, and we can we could even give the link to the the page in his blog where he's released if you want to just. Because once in a while, I do, I've done a blog post about the art as well, and I do occasionally get people coming and go, oh, wait a minute, I recognize that. That's from Tyrion. You're a big fat phony, sir, and it's fine. It's completely above board. And I really like the art, and I've always wanted to use it, so it seems fine. But um, when just, just tying this in there now, when you're asking, what's another good skill? And I think that this is almost a second skill from... I mean, just brains and persistence help. So, I mean, brains help. Like, I have to say, it, guts matter more than brains. I think mm. that there are people dumber than you who make more money than you. <laughs> right. No problem. But it, they just have more guts, and it, it's almost like faith or something. I mean, somehow, an, an image I spent a lot of time looking at actually is uh, Lord Vishnu. I mean, Jordan Peterson has equipped me to deal with these things a bit more. Lord Vishnu sits in the Sea of Milk, I think. It might be the Sea of Yogurt. I think it's a Sea of Milk. And he sits on this massive snake. I um, might be mispronouncing things, but it's called Ananta Shesha, the, the Endless Serpent. So it's, it seems like the Aerobarus Worm or something, you know. It's, it's infinity. He's just sitting in infinity, even though infinity, I guess, is also in the milk. It's probably not meant to be taken too literally. And... And I'm, I'm so in the pictures I've seen, like the the three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are like there on his umbilical cord or something. But and obviously I think he's also but he's also in this other other diagram. It's very weird. But the important thing is, I feel like Ananta Shesha is kind of the greatest possible monster. Like he's an infinite snake. Snakes are normally the bad guys. He's got infinite heads. He's infinitely long. 
he just kind of he registers to me like this sort of impossible to solve problem mm. in many ways. When Jordan Peterson talks about how snakes are kind of the the part, and this is like evolution stuff. This isn't even really opinion. This is the part of the brain that evolved to deal with snakes has become kind of co-opted for things like problems and uncertainty and things that are hidden and stuff. So, so anyway, so Lord Vishnu is able to sleep on this complete monster, basically. It's a good monster, I guess, but he's kind of made his peace so much with uncertainty and, and problems and all this stuff that he's able to just sleep there. And I, I somehow that's the image I think of, like that's sort of the ideal you've got to strive for. Yeah. You've got to be able to take, weird things that uh, other people will think are just the biggest monsters and just kind of say, it's fine, it's fine, they, they will do us no harm. Well, because I mean, uncertain, I mean, uncertainty and danger is another big thing, I think, because what, what I think you've got to do if you want to truly become rational is disentangle uncertainty and danger. Because um, what used to happen was you would have uh, the world outside your cave was dangerous, right? So people, so and that lingers with us. Like people are very cautious about doing anything new. You, you go to somebody who works with you and say you want to stop doing this test and do a different test instead. Like they will scream. I, I'm mm. kind of serious. Like if, if you want to make enemies try to change something, just try yeah. doing anything anything new with with ordinary folk, and they will just scream because they think there's there's danger right around the corner of what they don't know, and it just keeps them fenced in there. So. There's that sort of the the confidence to to move forward into the unknown, but also just to know that there there is something at the end, even if you can't see it. Because I mean, I, I go through a bit of a cycle anyway. I think like I've been working on this for years now, and you do have a bit of a cycle. Of sometimes you think, well, what am I even fighting for? Like, like I'm working on the the load game menu now. It's not very glamorous, you know. People are going to say, yeah, that's the load game menu, Ken, but what about new spaceships and new, new question? And like, no, I haven't, haven't got to those yet, and I haven't got to those for, for years. <laughs> and so you sort of need the, the faith to persist and the faith to realise there is something at the end of all this nonsense. It might take a very long time. We can't expect to just sort of get the I think being an employee kind of gives you the wrong idea as well. Like when, when you sign up to be an employee, you're given your wages at the end of each month, right? And they tell you in advance how much wages you're going to get. And, and that's very nice and everything, but it's all very kind of artificial. And then as soon as you start doing your own thing, you're, you're forced to tangle with the, the real thing where the, there is no nice tidy pay packet of a exactly definable amount at the end of the month. And it's actually going to be okay anyway. You do actually find out you don't need that false reassurance. Well, that kind of cycles us back to uh, the marketing, which we which we definitely needed to uh, explore a bit because I think that's one of the areas that an indie, you, you know, you there's there's this idea, you know, I'm going to break away from all these things that are a nuisance. You know, I'm going to get away from all the legal stuff, all the um, uh, management stuff, all the marketing stuff, and I'm just going to make my game, right? And that's, uh, well, maybe not, right? If you're going to, if, if you can for a while, to money, right? If you, yeah, if you've got someone else to deal with the other stuff, maybe, yeah. I mean, well, that's another, that's another common cycle, I guess. Rebels go through, isn't it? They they see all this these kind of old institutions. They, well, why is everything set up this way? It's so big and inefficient and clunky, and mm -hmm. and, and maybe it is even. Maybe it could be good to burn some of it down and put something else in its place. But yeah, the, why is everything set up this way? And then you you go and try and do things by yourself and eventually you find oh that that's why that's why marketing exists mm -hmm. that's why we release adverts yeah so i clearly i guess a, a big i guess a useful thing to just swallow early would be marketing exists and you will have to do some of it and that's what the blog is like yeah but i might as well be upfront about it i mean yeah every blog post i write is an advert for my game <laughs> ultimately i'm trying to do my like i say my nefarious plan is to give value at the same time but Make no mistake, all those blogs, all those blog posts are self-promotion and they are intended ultimately to make me money. And I think that there's there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm that that's another I've seen quite a lot of this in the books I read. Like a lot of people seem to think that marketing stuff is kind of seedy or it's it's you know, about these slick sales pitches and you've got to be got to be evil and trick people and that there's always some sort of trick out of it. And 
kind of no, like it's fine. It's fine. Just healthy. It's just healthy exchange. It's fine. Right. Right. Mutually beneficial is is really the key, right? You want players, yeah. you, you want them to exchange money to be able to play your game, and there there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that, right? Because you've put all this work in, and so it's not terribly unreasonable yeah. to ask for <laughs> uh, money to support you so that you can make more games. <coughs> and so, uh, you know, but at, at the same time. You want that player who's who's given their hard earned money to have a gaming experience that they they come away with saying, I am very glad I did that. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's well, really about mutually beneficial. Yeah. And for one thing, I think back to civilization again, like that that was the one that had you can invent trade. And the picture of trade mm -hmm. is just one guy has a bag of anonymous goods. One guy has some gold. And everyone's happy, you know, everything's fine. There is no third oppressed worker class being in, in the background. Also, there's, there's healthy exchange. Right. And uh, and then that kind of remains my vision, really. But I'm, I'm glad you mentioned both sides of this as well, because uh, one of my favorite blog posts I did is called Nobody Cares How Hard You Work, mm. which I think is another really important thing, because when you start doing something like this, like I've I've worked on this thing for, for years. I, I get I'm kind of... I'm okay now, I guess. I'm in the flow, but like, I get kind of drained on Saturdays after writing a blog post, honestly. Like, I'm not fighting fit in the Saturdays anymore just because I've written a blog post and spent all my MP or something doing that. But at the same time, I, I, I think n nobody cares about that, right? N yeah. no, if, you've, if you've got a... If, when they look on Steam, all they want is a good game, and they don't, they don't care how much blood went into it, and... I think they sort of shouldn't as well. That was really what the article was about. Like, first half is nobody cares how hard you work, and step two is actually they kind of shouldn't. And 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 I think that's a really important article I wrote, if I say so myself, because I, I see loads and loads of people out there saying, "Oh dear, I, I work so hard," and I bet most of them actually don't, by the way. But whatever, it's, even if they do, it's not about it's not about your input, right? It's about your output. Yes. I think converting changing your mindset to that is a lot more productive and you start to kind of you'll, you'll get a lot more successful that way thinking about what am i actually producing rather than just this sort of honor system and one thing hmm. uh, yeah because so for one thing it's i've realized it's, it's just this sort of equation like structure where you're thinking you put work in and then you get something out and the more work you put in the more you get out and it's, it's very linear i mean MJ DeMarco, who I have quoted once, I think, he um, he talks about wealth equations and stuff. And I realized this this kind of flat equation of I work hard, I deserve X amount because I've worked X hard, is this very kind of simplistic, flat wealth equation. But what you really want is this kind of weird exponential thing or a way to make money while you sleep. Or there's, there's so much more out there and you're, you're going to really imprison yourself if you've got this kind of flat perspective on how how anything is achieved really just work hard and there's so much more to it than that even though you do have to work hard yeah the visual that comes for hard work for me is imagining a yard uh where some one person is cutting the grass with scissors and another person is in a riding lawnmower right i mean, I mean I either way the grass that. gets cut one person worked very, very hard, right? They, they, I mean, it took yeah. a level of skill and a level of effort that's just off the charts to use those scissors. And who cares, right? Because... Nobody I, cares I, how hard he works, yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 I regret not using that now, actually. If only I'd heard that sooner, because I, I had a little thing about cake. So I think I had one guy bakes a cake, wastes a bunch of ingredients, and kind of comes up, oh, oh, it took me all night to bake this cake. And then somebody else baked exactly the same cake. First time, easy. Like, who do you hire? It's not the hard worker. Even though, I mean, ultimately, I think necessary but not sufficient is a thing you'll hear a lot. Yeah. At least for me. And like, yeah, hard work is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Well, uh, Ken, this, this conversation has not felt like hard work at all. I've really enjoyed <laughs> uh, talking to you. And, uh, you know, as we're, as we're approaching the uh, hour mark, I wanted to uh, respect your time, respect the viewers, and, and uh, give you a chance to, to um, wrap up with any message or any uh, call to action that you, that you wanted our, our guests to uh, take advantage of. Um, in fact, can I send you a little video of game footage? Show maybe. that I while I talk. This is going to be a lot better to just have that 
Yeah, I can edit that in at, at the end. I'll, I'll let's imagine that I'm I'm showing that video right now. All right, cool, cool. So um, maybe we could have me in the corner or something. I don't know. I won't give you too much work. Yeah, Super Space Galaxy is a game I'm making designed around player freedom. So far, and there is a playable demo you can get on Itch.io and Steam, and uh, it's designed around being able to fly wherever you want. You you go to planets, you gather resources, you shoot these drone guys, and you can find weapons and side weapons and super weapons and things to upgrade your ship. <clears throat> And uh, I'm currently working on the load game menu, not that that's particularly glamorous. And uh, there's going to be quests and things where you, you explore this galaxy and it's all randomly generated. So that you begin in the middle of the map, but you don't quite know what the city will look like, or what where the planets will be, or what their names will be, and all this stuff. So it's designed around kind of going off script in a way, it doesn't have very much script. So it's uh, based around all my gaming principles really. And uh, yeah, it's been a bit a long journey to get there, but uh, the the game is still going. And if you want to uh, keep up to date and it being developed, then you can subscribe to my blog. My Twitter is mostly updates about what's on the blog. Although it has been it's been useful because I've got a musician I'm working with now in one of the uh, combat tracks, and he uh, he was kind of kept reminded of the game by what's happened on Twitter. So must have worked. But anyway, check it out if you want. If not, I hope some of my stuff about steering other indie game developers the right way has been useful anyway. I think somehow the, all the, the knowledge you bleed for seems to, uh, seems to be the best, unfortunately. So if you're, if you're a uh, player, then you've got one direction you can go that hopefully uh, you'll be excited by when you, as you look at the, uh, the video here. And if you're more of a game developer, then that blog, that's gold, man. That, that is some good stuff that you put out there. Oh, well, thanks. I try. I kind of. I feel. I feel like this has been necessary, but not sufficient in itself. Really, um, <laughs> right. I seems like we, we could probably do more material if you're up for it. But um, we can talk about that later, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I uh, don't think this will be our last conversation. So thanks for uh, 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 joining me, and we'll see you next time on Jester of Godot.